Greetings uh, to our valued AACP members, friends, and guests. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Today, we have the pleasure and honor of hosting Dr. David McIntosh and Dr. Carlos Vise. The forum for today will consist of an introduction from Dr. Vise and followed by a feature interactive presentation uh, with Dr. McIntosh. That's gonna have an open floor for Q&A session. Have an open floor. So any questions that you might have during the presentation or any topics you feel you might want uh, him to touch on, just go ahead and post those over in the chat section to the right. Uh, and so next I'd like to introduce uh, today's moderator, uh, Dr. Vise. Uh, he is the chair of the education committee for the AACP and also a diplomat uh, on that same board. So uh, he has his own practice in Dallas, been opening up recently and uh, has been had the opportunity to really get interacted uh, with a lot, of, a lot of the patients down there. Uh, but he definitely has uh, concentrated in cranio, orofacial pain, sleep, and orthopedic. Uh, so Dr. Bise. Thank you, uh, appreciate it, Jordan. Um, today today we're, uh, we're in for a very special treat. Um, uh, I met Dr. McIntosh a couple of years ago in a lecture that he gave to a group in uh, Dallas sponsored by the local Asian Dental Study Club that I've never heard about before. I get the tip from a local uh, colleague and I was so glad that uh, I actually made the time to attend uh, the two hour lecture that turned into a three to four hour discussion Q&A with David. Uh, Dr. McIntosh uh, passion reflects in the way he speaks about the subject and uh, the time he, he stayed that day uh, discussing the subject. He literally wore us all out and he was still ready to go when we were done at about three to four hours. Um, and it, it, it was a wonderful, very insightful lecture. So I, I, was, uh, I knew then that I had to uh, share my experience with the rest of my ACB colleagues. Uh, so I'm so glad and so thankful uh, to him for agreeing to give us this, le uh, this lecture today. Uh, David, Dr. McIntosh holds a PhD related uh, to healing after sign of surgery and also has a pediatric specialty uh, uh, qualifications. Uh, Dr. McIntosh is an adjunct uh, associate professor of ENT in Queensland, Australia, where he practices. He has a special interest in pediatric ENT, nose and sinus disease, uh, and snoring and sleep apnea. He has an international, uh, he, he is an international recognized uh, specialist in the field of interplaying between ENT and dentistry. So in other words, he is the ENT that we all dentists that practice TMD and sleep uh, dentistry dream of having close to us. Uh, he runs uh, the online uh, Facebook page ENT for dental practitioners, and ENT updates for the GP. Uh, it's a great um, uh, it's a great uh, Facebook group that I would highly recommend you you, you join and, and and look for great information there. Uh, he has published a book called Snore to Death, where he uh, writes on this subject, uh, a book I highly recommend, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it already. Uh, so he's, while we are finishing here in Texas, our our Thursday, he's starting his his Friday morning down under. Um, I understand it's a beautiful day there, David, and we're so glad to have you. So I'm going to give you the stage so you can start talking to us. Welcome. Thank you, thank, thank you so much, Carlos. It's, it's, it's lovely to hear your voice again. Was, I, I do remember that day, and as 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 you've alluded to, I, I can be the person that's hard to shut up sometimes when I get going on this topic. So uh, you will have to keep me to time again, uh, but. I would encourage, as you've already uh, said, uh, questions, because the the reason I'm here, as I, as I say each and every time when I do these things, the reason I'm here is not to hear my own voice. It's really basically to be a resource and benefit uh, to those that want to take the time to listen. And, and thank you to those that are here doing so at the moment. My my approach has uh, come about uh, with regards to sharing my knowledge, sharing my information is because I think ultimately uh, we have to accept one thing, uh, is that we're not going to be here forever and then whatever we take with us is gone. So whatever I can share and decimate and uh, or disseminate, rather not decimate, but disseminate uh, and, 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 and plant seeds for people to have a think about and reflect upon, gives them the opportunity to look at what's there and then see what makes sense and what they want to continue to, to further grow. And I always suggest people take everything that's said, including from myself with a grain of salt, uh, use it as an opportunity to go and explore the information, explore the topic. So if I say something that's contrary to what you thought, then that is a learning opportunity. It, it's, it's not a moment for a debate. It's a moment of reflection and, and go back and go, okay, well, I'd always thought this, this person is saying something different. 
let's go back. And then that's actually how I've, I've, I've learned so much is because I, I had preconceived ideas and notions and, I, and, and thoughts on, on topics. And then people were coming in and saying things that, that didn't make sense to me that I'd never heard of before. And, and the, the natural automatic instinct is, is to disparage those things. But I, I went the other way around and I went and looked into it. And then I started to realize, ah, oh, okay. Uh, and, and in doing so, I, I found different outcomes. So sometimes the outcome was, huh, I was wrong. I just learned something. And that's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, you know, we should relish the fact that we can upgrade and change our, our knowledge and perspective uh, as, as we should. And other times it gave me the insight to say, ah, I can see why that person is thinking that way. And I can then understand why they would come to those conclusions. But I can also see why that process is actually in my mind wrong. And I can try and help them see it from a different perspective. So when I started getting into the education uh, sphere of, of where I found myself, it was actually stimulated by me observing what dentists were being taught uh, in, in seminars, in lectures, in courses. And uh, the analogy that I use is that if I was as an ENT was to start to go and start running dental courses on root canal therapy, um, I think you would all be very circumspect as to what I have to say. And what I noted was that with all the best of intentions, there were some teachers and education courses uh, within the dental sphere where they were teaching ENT things, um, but they clearly were teaching them from a position of uh, not being an ENT. And it, I, I am not a, a dentally trained person. If you, if you want to nominate the dumbest person in the room uh, when I'm, I'm doing these talks for the dental community, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's me. You ask me a dental question and I'll just look at you blankly and go, I don't know. Um, but that's the thing is I don't need to know. And, and I don't want people to feel that they need to be an ENT to understand this. But I also feel that they need to know enough to know when there's a problem. So I started looking at, at, at what was being taught and what was being shared. And I started to realize that uh, there was misinterpretation of, of, of things and misunderstanding of things. Uh, and that was then being perpetuated in terms of uh, something. And, and as, as, as we know, if something is said often enough, frequently enough, it, it, it morphs into something that's real without actually then going back to how do we get to this in the first place? And then uh, we need to then go and sort of go, well, what is the evidence behind that? And then that's the one thing I want to bring to the table is, is I always want to bring evidence to the conversation. It's OK to say we don't know when we don't know, we can speculate, but we need to nominate you know, or, or declare that we are speculating. So that, that's that's sort of the, the background that I bring bring to the table in terms of the um, evolution of things. And as time has gone by, I've, I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky to have so many people from so many backgrounds bring ideas and perspectives and so forth to the table uh, that I look at and, and I reflect upon. And I use it as an opportunity to see if it fits into to, to my way of thinking, my way of doing things. And that has immensely helped the way that I, I, I deliver healthcare because the, the big thing that was challenging for me as an ENT, if we go way, way back to how this started to come about, was dealing with kids with sleep disordered breathing. So sleep disordered breathing is a spectrum of problems that entails what ENTs used to sort of think of just being sleep apnea, children that stop breathing at night. But what we then realized is that we had this group of children where they weren't stopping breathing at night, but they were clearly struggling to stop breathing and they were demonstrating some daytime symptoms similar to the children with the sleep apnea. But because they were having sleep tests and the sleep tests were showing that these kids didn't have sleep apnea, we were saying, oh, well, we don't need to fix those kids. But then some brave souls started fixing those kids and they started to get, show improvements. So we started to shift away from thinking that a sleep study was, was the be all and end all in terms of defining, you know, what we need to know in a child in terms of fixing them. And then we started to notice that we had these kids that were snoring and we then thought, oh, well, that's just snoring. That's just noise. But they're not struggling to breathe. Obviously, they're not stopping breathing. Um, they're going to be OK. But they weren't OK. They were having disrupted sleep. They were having trouble, uh, you know, their noses being blocked and mouth breathing, for example. Uh, and then the mouth breathing starts to come into the conversation, too, even if they're not snoring. 
So all of a sudden, this spectrum of sleep disorder breathing entails mouth breathing, snoring, what we call upper airways resistance, which is where there's a, a struggle to breathe, but the, the breathing is successful, albeit uh, impeded. Um, and then where it is actually uh, not successful, which is the apneas. And the thing about, you know, the great thing about being an ENT in terms of the upbringing was that all we've got to do is take out the tonsils and adenoids and get things unblocked and they're okay. And, and that works actually very well to a certain point, uh, but it doesn't work entirely. And, and the only sort of reason that that honestly was drawn to my attention was because of the dental community saying, yeah, that's all well and good, David, but have you seen this research? And I hadn't seen the research. Uh, so having it uh, brought to my attention um, was actually beneficial to me because it allowed me to progress and change the paradigm. And it's ironic because the paradigm that I use in kids is the one that I've been preaching in adults for, for far, far longer. So in adults, uh, which is where you know the story repeats itself in, in some regards, is that uh, historically we noticed with adults that we had a cohort of patients that were snoring at night, stopping breathing and having car accidents. And it was the car accidents and, and, and so forth that was overrepresented in this group that actually led us to focusing on obstructive sleep apnea as, as an entity in adults. It wasn't the blood pressure, it wasn't the heart problems, it wasn't the diabetes, it wasn't the strokes, it wasn't the mental health problems, it was the car accidents. That's how this story started. So we worked out those adults, if we do a sleep study, if they've got sleep apnea, they're more at risk of having a car accident. That's unacceptable. We cannot let them drive their car because they are at risk. We certainly can't let them be driving their big heavy rigged truck uh, down the highway uh, going at 80, 90, 100 miles an hour coming around a corner um, because they may have a micro sleep and just keep going straight when they should be turning. So we learned from, from you know, that uh, in, in adults that we need to treat sleep apnea. Uh, but again, we took a generic approach. We thought, well, they're blocked. Uh, we're ENT surgeons. All we've got to do is do an operation. What do we need to fix? Well, we need to take out their tonsils. We need to fix their palate. That was a, a big focus. And we thought, again, pat ourselves on the back. Oh, yes, we're very clever. We fixed them. But the reality was we weren't fixing them. We go and do the sleep studies again, and they, they still had residual disease. Surgery wasn't the answer, but surgery had a, had a crack at it, did badly. So because it did badly, we ended up going and throwing that one out and then jumping all the way across to the paradigm of CPAP. And CPAP was a brilliant treatment that only about a third to 40%, so 30 to 40% of people actually stick with. So it might be a brilliant treatment, but if, if so few people are sticking with it, then it's not so brilliant after all. Uh, so then we start to go, all right, what else can we do? And then we start to sort of have the dental community come into the mix and say, well, look, we can do these splints. We can start to, you know, reposition the jaw. Uh, and, and splints actually, you know, although they're not as good as CPAP, actually have a, a, a greater uptake and, and greater use. So if you look at it numerically in terms of the number of people that use it, which basically defines your successful treatment outcome, then you know splints are actually better. But then we go, well, does a splint work for everybody? No, it doesn't. How can we work out if a splint, you know, is going to work or not? Uh, and again, you know, the process of you know of evolution is the ENT start to creep back into the story. And we go, well, we can have a look. We can have a look inside their nose. We can have a look inside their throat, and and we can start to see other things. And in the process of doing that, we realise that in adult obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the, the diagnosis is just the label. We need to work out the why, and the sleep studies won't tell us the why. They'll, t they'll tell us how bad someone's obstruction is, but they won't tell us why they're obstructed. So the ENTs can come into the mix and have a physical exam and see what's going on, and then start directing the traffic, and then can start to go, oh, okay, the nose is blocked, we've got a, a deviated septum, we've got hay fever and allergy, we need to clear the nose, we need to get an allergy doctor involved, they've got reflux, we need to treat the reflux, they're overweight, we need to work on diet, exercise, lifestyle, maybe bariatric surgery. Uh, they've got big tonsils, we need to take those out and so on and so forth. So that, you know, we start to direct the traffic. So for, for a long time, for adults, we've been saying that we need to work out why they've got it and fix it. But we'd never done that in kids, coming back to the kids. We'd always just gone to the generic approach of tonsils and adenoids, tonsils of adenoids. And when you take a generic approach uh, and you get a really good outcome, you get diluted into that's good enough. So if we look at children, we take out their tonsils and adenoids without any effort at, at really of any real proper clinical assessment. 
around about 80% of those kids will fix. So you, you can actually look really, really good and really, really clever with, with pretty much zero effort. But within those 80%, 80% of those that we fixed, uh, again, relapsed. So, uh, sorry, uh, uh, maintained and the other 20% relapsed. So if you look at the numbers, 80% of 80% is 64%. So roughly speaking, if you give an ENT surgeon uh, the opportunity to take out tonsils and adenoids, they'll fix two thirds of the kits. Uh, and, and, and that seems to hold, you know, pretty, pretty good. But what about those other 30%, you know, that, that other third, where, where are they falling down? And they are falling down because they have nasal problems that are not addressed. They have myofunctional problems that are not addressed. They have jaw and orthodontic problems that are not addressed. And we are learning the hard way as ENTs that we're not as clever as we thought we were. And I think, again, you know, I take that as a great opportunity to, to, to have that pointed out to us so that we can grow and we can progress. And we start to then look at, well, you know, where, are the, where else are these kids turning up? Where, where are we going wrong? Where, whereabouts can we improve what we are doing for the benefit of, of the greater good? And, and one of those areas is, is, again, coming back to dealing with the dental community. The dental community is finding these kids far better than anybody else. And you're finding them for a host of reasons. You are finding them because you look in the oral cavity and you can see at the back of the throat and you can see the big tonsils. You are looking at the jaws and you can see the maxillary constriction. You can see the retrognathia. You can see the soft tissue changes. You can see the tongue tie. You can see them struggling to breathe in your chair as you're doing things. You can see that they've got a hypersensitive gag reflex. You, you, you are in, in, intimately aware that there is something else going on uh, and then putting the pieces together, uh, look, you beat the medical doctors, you know, long, long time way back. And that's okay. We've just got to accept that there's, there's, there's again, the benefit of, of working together to, to get these better outcomes. So how, you know, do we go about this? How do we get these kids better than what they are? Uh, and and the, the short answer to that is teamwork. And it's knowing that uh, I can't fix everything and knowing that the other treatments that are out there that, that have great benefits potentially have better benefits when the ENT has actually gone first and got those bits out of the way and, 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 and not, uh, you know, the intention of fully getting things sorted, but it opens the door to things going forwards. And the perfect examples that I use that is, is in the context of my functional therapy and orthodontics. Uh, if, if you look again at the research, if you have a child that's obstructed and, and, and the ENTs come in and relieve some of that obstruction, if you look at the myofunctional disorders that were present in terms of the way that they were having to compensate for, for problems, if the airway is adequately addressed, some of those compensations are no longer necessary and they start to resolve and there is a spontaneous improvement. It's similar with orthodontics. I know it's controversial, but you know the research is out there. You don't have to believe it all, but it, it's there for those that want to just absorb it and, and reflect upon it. So there's, there's something great to be said about letting the ENTs have first go at, at, at things. But where else are these people turning up? So kids are turning up earlier and younger with TMJ and TMD problems. Uh, ENTs are very, very familiar. You may be surprised to learn, but very familiar with TMJ problems. Uh, and the reason we're very familiar with it in adults is because they turn up complaining of a sore ear. And the usual story with the sore ear is that they've seen their local medical doctor who's been uh, treating them blindly basically on the premise that it's an ear infection with multiple rounds of antibiotics that make no difference. They come and see someone like me. Uh, we have a look at their ear. Uh, it's perfectly normal. They have no ear symptoms otherwise to suggest that they were having anything that's even remotely related to an ear infection. They've got referred pain from their TMJ. We can, can feel the crevitus when we get them to open and close their jaw. We can feel the pterygoid muscle tenderness if, if we go inside and, and palpate and then see that they've got TMD going on as well. And then we'd sort of go, oh, you've got that, and we'd send them back to the dentist. And the dentist would then go and make a, a, a occlusal splint uh, because that was the paradigm. Um, and you know the, these patients would have some resolution of their pain to some degree. Uh, but it would not necessarily be a success. They, they were also in the process of having this noted to be clenching and grinding and they'd be destroying the, the, the splints that the dentist had made. So we started to have this cluster effect where they're 
they're there, uh, got this TMJ and the TMD, they're also sort of clenching and grinding. And we sort of thought, oh gosh, all right, so we need to, you know, protect them against the damage because the clenching and grinding will be feeding into the TMJ and the TMD. So let's make another splint uh, and let's make a splint where we're going to reposition things. Uh, and in the process of repositioning things, that repositioning was to put the mandible and, and set it back a bit. Uh, and the problem that we learned, and we all learn, you know, medical and dental people alike, is that we miss something. We miss something in this adult population group that we're presenting to us. And the thing that we missed was that they had an underlying airway problem a lot of the time, and that their airway problem was causing low oxygen levels. Those low oxygen levels we know now through a thing called the trigeminocardiac reflex, uh, which is where the um, low oxygen levels results in a brain stress response that results in an adrenaline surge, that results in an elevation of the blood pressure through the, um, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, increasing the heart rate and the heart contractility, and increasing the uh, uh, sympathetic tone of the blood vessels, puts the blood pressure up, just past the heart, there's a little nerve receptor that detects that blood pressure going up. It sends a message back to the brain saying blood pressure is too high. We need to calm things down. Part of that interacts with the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is the nerve of the muscles of mastication. So we get this reflex response where they start grinding their teeth. And it's proposed that maybe this movement is somehow to open up the jaw, move the jaw forwards which is opposite to what we were doing with these occlusal splints for TMJ and TMD, and making their airway worse. So we weren't actually helping these people, we were actually harming them. And we were harming them because we didn't realise there was an underlying pathology. And then if we go back and, and, and learn from that mistake, as we have, we realise that, yes, these people might need splints, but they need splints that improves their airway, not that it's detrimental to it. And we've got to find a balance there in terms of taking the, the, the mandible forwards, but then obviously not uh, hurting the TMJ in the process. So we've actually made our job a lot harder rather than easier by, by being cleverer. Um, but, you know, we need to accept these realities and challenges in life uh, because that's the, 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 the reality of, of the world that we live in. So then we mucked around with adults for a while. And then, when, you know, um, we started to realise we've got all these grinding kids and if I look back at my own sort of personal thing around it, it's certainly in the Australian landscape. Seven or eight years ago, I was telling the dental community here in Australia, you've got bruxism in kids wrong. Um, you've got it wrong in kids. It's, you've got to start thinking airway, okay? You, it, it's not the sort of thing you let them out grow. It's not the sort of thing that you accept as normal. Teeth grinding, it's a body stress response. Oh, the kids are stressed. We need to send them to a psychologist. What four-year-old is stressed about losing their job? What four-year-old is worried about their mortgage? What four-year-old is worried about their girlfriend finding out they've been cheating on them? Okay, we do occasionally find children in stressful situations, but the stress that these children have is not psychological, it's physiological. It's a physiological stress because of the low oxygen levels. And we get their airways sorted and around about 80% of the time, the teeth grinding stops. So the teeth grinding is a symptom. As much as it is in adults, it's a symptom of something. We need to go look for that something. So the paradigm changes. And we start to now have the situation where we have the kids and they are grinding their teeth. The dentists here and, and hopefully everywhere else, their, their, their reflex response is to screen for an airway problem. So that's the teeth grinding and that's the sort of, you know, the splint side of things. But then we have this next problem where these kids, and I'm seeing them younger and younger, I'm seeing them as teenagers now, um, are getting TMJ and TMD. You know, we're basically seeing the, 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 the cases that we missed and, and, and so forth when we should have been picking up the pieces at a, at a much younger age. And, and this is, again, where I come from, as, as, as you'll hear repeatedly. I, I, I want teamwork to be the thing that we really strive and, and, and encourage. I want people to be in a, in a position where they uh, don't think that they can fix everything. You know, I'm, I'm telling you now as an ENT, I can't fix all the airway problems. So I want dental people to realize they can't fix all of the dental problems in the context of where there's an underlying pathology. And I, and I can give you a huge list of, of dental things. You know, TMJ, TMD is the perfect example because you've got to get the airway sorted. Orthodontics, perfect example. 
um, and I know this is anecdotal, uh, but let, let, let's just be practical and simple for one moment. I, I have dentists that have been doing orthodontics longer than I've been in ENT. And in the process of them doing their orthodontics, uh, they get certain results and outcomes. They, over time, have been aware of this airway thing and entertained me, you know, I guess is probably the best way of saying it, with, with you know, the curiosity and say, all right, well, we'll give you a go, David. You, you come here and before I do my orthodontics, you sort this airways thing out. And in the process of doing that, then they sort of would proceed with their orthodontics. Anecdotally, many have come back and say, Dave, this orthodontics is actually working a lot better. Um, and, and, and for some of them, it's evolved to the point they actually refuse to do the orthodontics. They will not take the case. If a child has an airway problem and that airway problem is not addressed and managed uh, to their satisfaction, they won't take the orthodontic case on because they put two and two together, look back at their experience and realise that if they looked at where their failures were, and we all get failures, I told you I can't fix all the airway problems, if they looked at where their orthodontic failures were, they were turning up more so in these airway cases. And so they, they've changed their perspective from that point of view. If I look at something like early dental caries, okay, so let's talk about paediatric dentistry for a while. So if we look at uh, third world numbers, so if you look at the rate of early dental caries in third world countries that have poor access to simple measures such as uh, dental hygiene, fluoride, toothpaste, etc., cetera, uh, eating foods that are not nutritious, high in all of the, the, the stuff that's, that the processed foods has to offer. If we look at the research, we, we see numbers that are terrifying, you know, early, denti, early dental carry rate of around about 80 to 90%. It's, it's, it's frightening. You go look at the kids with sleep disorder breathing that have mouth breathing. The research shows that around about 95% of those killed children will have signs of early dental caries when you look hard for them. That's more than those children in third world countries with the bad diet and poor dental care. So from that point of view, um, we're dealing with a far bigger problem than, 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 than we really truly appreciated. But that's that that that's that's a point of, of, of opportunity, not a point of just of, of, of giving up. So that that's me sort of throwing lots of sort of things just up in the air at the moment. So I want to throw all these balls in the air because I don't really know where they're going to land at the moment in terms of what people want out of me. So that's my first half hour of of just 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 mm -hmm. rambling, uh, just jumping all over the place, but just giving you guys basically a snippet of what I do. And what I do is try and join the dots. I try and, and, and beg, borrow and steal things from a broad spectrum of things. The ENT stuff, I've got sorted. You know, if I haven't got the ENT stuff sorted by now, I've got a problem. But my ENT stuff evolves too. The dental stuff, I'm not dentally trained, but I'm, I, I'm picking stuff up and so forth. Um, as was alluded to, I run these educational Facebook pages. I'm gonna tell you now, it's total self-interest for my own benefit. Um, it holds myself accountable. It makes me go and read these things and learn from these things. Um, and then once I've done so, as I said, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to walk the face of this earth forever. None of us are. If, if I if I acquire this stuff and I keep it all to myself, as it, like it's a little you know you know um, you know thing from Lord of the Rings, my precious. Um, that, that, that there's no greater good that can come out of that. So, but I don't stop at dentistry. It, you'll see, I go and read neurology, I go and read psychiatry, I, I go and read from all these different places where people have had uh, some interest on, on the topic. But in the process of doing that, what I then do is have a situation where I am bringing it together uh, and, and so forth and going, hey, look, we had these pieces of the puzzle. I just worked out how they can click together. And now I may be wrong how I'm clicking them together, but no one's tried to click them together before. And they seem to fit pretty well. And for the moment, let's just leave them there. And if we get some more and we need to reposition them, we can reposition them. So I think of this as like a jigsaw puzzle. And, and we've, we've basically had all these pieces, but we never actually knew, one, how they fit together, or two, what the picture looked like. And we're getting a better understanding of what the picture looks like, which then means we know which piece to try and find to then put in the right spot. So like I said, that's just me rambling for a bit, just trying to give you some insight and, and so forth. So that was a, a deliberate jumping around. Now, what I'm going to do is look at uh, what's in front of me in terms of the questions that are here. Um, so um, from that point of view, um, if, if people want to sort of uh, uh, speak up uh, by the questions uh, or, or Carlos, if you want to drive, drive the boat uh, or drive oh. the ship. 
uh, as well. Yeah, I, I want to intercede for a second just to clarify a couple of things, and then we'll try Excellent. to go through the questions. Right, 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 right. Um, Thank you. I mean, th this thing you mentioned about splints is very important because the, the most common splint that Dennis makes is called the flat the flat plane splint that tends to distalize the, the, the mandible, like you said. We, we in our academy, we are not big fans of that type of splint. Most of the splints that we use put the condos back, back in centric position. We find that a lot of these people have uh, deficient maxillas, therefore their condos yep. are distalized. That's how they end up with their ear aches. Yep. Uh, so once we reposition them to centric relationship on the condos, then they're much better. And that's always forward, never back. Yep. Um, we find that, you know, there's been plenty of studies to find, uh, to find that, that um, the flat uh, plane splints cause more apnea in, in certain situations because it distalizes the jaw more. So uh, that's just, just one quick, quick, quick thing to mention yeah. to you of what we yeah. believe. Yeah, uh, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, 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 I know that I'm talking to a very educated and a very informed audience, but, but in the process of doing that, what I want to try and do is show off to them to let them know that I know that <laughs> this yeah, is Yeah, yeah. No, you, you understand what, yeah. what those flat planes are doing. That, that's why splints get such a bad rep, too. Yeah. Because people think yeah. of what's, what, what are the most popular splints, and they say, already had one of those. So we every time we see people on our TMD practices, we ask them, I said, if you had a spleen before, please bring them in so we can show them how they work and what they were doing to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. The, the, one of the things that we um, believe, too, is very much from working with 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 a group of people, other experts, people like you that are ENTs, who work with physical therapists, with myofunctional therapists, different people that help us with these things. Um, so I agree with you 100% that we cannot have all the answers and all the solutions yeah. and yeah. Uh, te teamwork should be encouraged by, by far. Yeah. Um, one, one of the things that, that, that I think helps us, a, a lot of us now have a, a, a full volume CVCT in our office, oh, which yes, a, a lot of ENTs don't have. So we, we get to see a lot of things and learn a lot of what's going on in the nose and other areas where we don't concentrate on all the time. Yep. I, I, I sometimes get frustrated because I, I, I my, one of my biggest group of referrals are the ENTs because of the year situation, what the, the year aches. Yep. Yep. Um, and, um, but a lot of times we get, for example, people that come in, we have kids that are very asymmetric. You can see one side of the maxilla is less developed. And yep. lo and behold, when you look at the CBCD, you find out that one of the maxillary standards is totally cloudy. Uh, and you see that they're having a problem with development. There's not, not enough growth. Yep. And I, I recently, just prior to um, having my, um, uh, having the interruption with the, the COVID, uh, yep. I sent a patient over to have a consultation because this, this girl was very lopsided, very little growth on one side, and it was very obvious what was going on to me in, in, in the nose and looking at the sinuses. And yep. they came back and told me, you know, they scoped her. They look, they didn't look at the CVCT. They couldn't open my CVCT for whatever technical reasons they yep. had. But when they scoped her, they said, oh, she's fine. Nothing yep. wrong with her. Yeah. So I, yeah. that's part of our frustration sometimes. Yeah. Look, I, 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 you know, like I said, I, I know that I'm talking to a very high end, very educated audience, and in the process of, of, of what I'm saying is uh, not not to sort of uh, you know take that away, but uh, people that that may not have heard me speak before, I, I, I want them to know that I know. So so everything you say, I completely agree with, and and the frustrations and so forth, um, you know, it, it, it it's not unfamiliar to me, and and this is this is one thing, and I think you know you, you've you've heard me say it before. Um, ENTs are not all the same. ENT, to me, if someone says they've seen the ENT, I'll be honest with you, that doesn't mean anything. Because the next question is, well, what sort of ENT did they see? Did they see the pediatric ENT? Did they see the head and neck cancer ENT? Did they see the nose special, you know, the ENT that does noses? Did they see the ENT that does ears? Did they see the ENT that, that, that does facial and cosmetic surgery? Do they see the ENT that does sleep apnea? Um, ENT is a big specialty. And, and when I talk, I use these analogies and, and so forth. And then when I do so, you can start to under, you know, people start to get the penny drops. So let's talk about general surgery, for example. Um, if you have breast cancer, okay, you are going to be going to see a general surgeon. They just happen to be a general surgeon that has specialized in breast cancer. So you don't go and see the general surgeon that has specialized in colon cancer because it wouldn't make sense to, but you are still seeing the general surgeon. So 
this this is a psychological thing that people need to change. We actually, to be honest, I would love to get rid of the word ENT because it's it's too generic. The the, the you know the, the, what you need to say is oh you've got a you've got a sinus problem we need to send you to the sinus surgeon or you know the sinus the si or even want to use ENT say preface it with sinus ENT. Oh, you've got a problem with uh, sleep apnea. We need to send you to the sleep apnea ENT. Um, you know, you need to have you know a, a range of, of tools. You know, and in dentistry, it's it, it's not a problem. You need you know if you have a periodontal problem, oh, we've got periodontists. If we can't manage that at a general level, we've got a periodontist. Um, you don't say we're sending you to the dentist. You say we're sending you to the periodontist because they've specialised uh, and so forth. And you don't say we're sending you to the specialist dentist. And this is, you know, I, I, I'm never going to win, but I, I'm just going to keep preaching. I, I really want to change the terminology so that people understand that seeing the ENT doesn't necessarily infer that that actually is adequate in, in, in its own right. Um, and this is, and I, and I cannot solve this for you, okay? Um, everyone's got to do their own background checks on their own neighbourhood in terms of who's around and, and get some sense of where their mind is at and so forth. And the thing I would reflect on what you've said, you know, is that if you're sending someone to somebody and you're getting the same result and that re result is a frustrating result and you continue to send people to that same person, you're actually part of the problem yeah. because you're repeating the process, expecting a different outcome, which, you know, doesn't make sense. So it's, 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 it's and, and, and look, the, the, the problem, if we're going to be honest, is, is that in terms of the excitement, the, the sexiness, of, of this topic, um, it's pretty boring um, from a surgeon's point of view. You know, you get to do the big, you know, head and neck cancer cases where you, you know, get to, you know, tear things apart and put it all back together and so forth. And, you know, it takes five or six hours. You know, that that's, you know, you know, ego boosting and, and, and so forth. Taking out tonsils and adenoids, man, that's, that, that's boring grunt work. That's the sort of stuff you give your residents to do um, because, you're, you know, that's below you. The difference is I actually love doing it. I, you know, I love doing it because I know the difference that I'm making. Like I, I rejoice in the moment when I have a child on the table who's got an airway problem where the parents have trusted me to put them through this invasive procedure because I know the outcome, you know, in terms of where this child is going to be down the track um, is, is going to be, you know, life transforming. Um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty fortuitous and, and privileged position to, to have to, to be able to do that for someone. So, so yeah, but look, don't get me wrong. I, I totally get the frustrations that are out there. I hear it all the time. Um, again, just move, just just keep moving forwards. You know, um, just 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 and and don't try and change people. You know, you, there's no way turning up to a colon cancer surgeon that you're going to convince them to fix breast cancer because you turned up with a hundred articles showing that fixing breast cancer is a good idea. Um, it's not their gig. Okay, it's the same. If if somebody sends a, a throat cancer to me, it's not my gig. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I will bounce it to someone else uh, that, that does it. The, the problem with the airway thing is a lot of them are in the position that I was in. Now, if you took me and, 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 and we were having this conversation 12 years ago, I would be one of these ENTs that everybody's frustrated with and by um, because I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and now that I do know it, um, I'm, I'm different and better for it. But, you know, that, that's, that's just pure luck and circumstance that I fell into, you know, what some people would call the wrong crowd, but it's <laughs> absolutely the right crowd. What so, we, yeah. Yeah, why don't we try to answer a few of these questions? I'm going to try to do the, yeah. the, the, yeah, the really questions, good questions good. and then go forward and try to yeah. do the answers brief. And we'll yeah, start going really down so we can, we can try to get everybody's. The first one that I saw was the role of the, uh, the, uh, the of pediatrician from birth to child to three-year-old. And yep. um, I think we, we have to discuss a little bit of early <coughs> early diagnosis on this very young kids. Yeah, so I think, I think I think I think I think I'll need to hopefully elaborate correctly on the question because um, you know as the question stands in its own right, every pediatrician needs to be involved with a kid between zero and three. But if we're talking about in the context of sleep disordered breathing, um, we've got to again. Then I can use you know ENT again as the perfect example. Um, it, but let's talk about pediatricians. Uh, first of all, are these pediatricians aware of what sleep disordered breathing is? Because if they don't know that they don't know, then we have the same conversation we just had about ENTs, okay? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, you know, do these pediatricians, and it's very individual, 
even support the notion of kids having their tonsils out. We, we have a very fascinating element of history in Australia that I'll, I'll condense for you. Uh, around about 11 years ago, there was a group of paediatricians who started writing what they intended to be the Australian guidelines on tonsillectomy. And the outcome, their, their objective in, in writing that outcome was to say that there is no good evidence that performing a tonsillectomy is a good idea in children. Um, and the paradigm that they were working with was within the context of tonsillitis. Now, we got lucky in Australia because the paediatric sleep physicians caught wind of this um, guideline that was being uh, crafted and, and said, hang on, guys, you're, 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 you're missing the, the whole airway problem. You know, these are the things, kids that we're seeing that, you know, these ENTs are fixing and making huge differences to. You know, you, you, if you're going to write guidelines on tonsillectomy, then you've got to include the people that actually do the damn thing in the first place, which are the ENTs. And begrudgingly, they let the ENTs come on board and then the ENTs brought the science to the table. And with the intended outcome of the guidelines being saying, essentially stop doing tonsillectomy. The outcome was that looking at the science and looking at our national numbers, it showed that we needed to increase the rate of tonsillectomy for sleep disordered breathing by a factor of nine to 10. So we needed basically a 900 to 1000% increase in the rate of tonsillectomy in this country and when the you know the agenda of those writing the guidelines was to stop the procedure essentially in its tracks so when we talk about pediatricians we've got to make sure that we have the right context of what sort of pediatrician are we talking about every pediatrician should be aware of, of you know kid problems but there's a limit to to what they can know and if i if you have me okay talk about pediatrics as a pediatrician i'd look stupid but likewise, if you have a paediatrician as a general comment, without being disparaging, talk about sleep disorder breathing, I'd look like the smart guy in the room. So I think you need to tailor the problem to the person that knows best about it. So um, from that point of view, you know, paediatricians absolutely belong in the, in, in the management and care of children, but there's a limit to what they know about everything that has to do with kids. Um, they, they do not know everything about everything, just like I don't know everything about ENT. They do not know everything about kids. Um, so uh, hopefully that's 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 addressing that side of things. Um, and then the um, other sort of thing that I've got in front of me. Um, he was asking about SIDS and SIDS and children. sleep. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, sleep apnea. So they're two different conditions. There's currently, and again, we've got to be careful because we've got to differentiate between obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. And we've got to look at the pathophysiology and we've got to look at the science and we've got to take out the emotion, okay? So when we look at sudden infant death syndrome, there are elements of it that we still don't fully understand. We know what certain risk factors are and we know certain things that seem to um, you know, be implicated in it. And when we look at these kids, we can see at a uh, um, uh, autopsy uh, assessment, when we look at their brain stem, the, the bit that actually controls breathing, there's something wrong with their brain stem the, the, in, you know, in terms of how those problems evolved and, and, and were created and, and got there. We, we're still trying to work out and understand if we're going to be honest. Uh, but um, from, a, from a, a practical point of view, uh, and a realistic point of view, um, there is nothing at the moment, at least that I'm aware of, and I'm happy to learn, there's nothing at the moment that brings obstructive sleep apnea in kids and SIDS together in the same conversation. There is, a, just as a point of reflection, because someone might bring this up, so I just want to preempt it, there is a paper that talked about uh, tongue ties and SIDS. Mm -hmm. And this paper is actually a, an excellent paper uh, for learning how to read a paper because the paper is terrible. Um, because what they did is they looked at children that had had SIDS and they went back and looked at autopsy photos and they looked specifically at the upper lip to see if there was any attachment of the upper lip to the gingival margin uh, using the, the uh, your, your good colleague, uh, Larry Kotlow's classification of a grade three or four to define that as an anatomical lip tie. Mm -hmm. And they found that in about 90% of kids that had died of SIDS, they had a lip tie. <laughs> and then what they, they transferred that to said, well, look, most kids with a lip tie have a tongue tie. Uh, so therefore tongue tie is, is implicated with SIDS. 
And if you were just to just walk through that and join the dots, you go, wow, that's really amazing. But you've got to pause for a moment and, 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 and tear that down. The first problem is that 90% of babies, of dead or alive, have a grade three, four Cotmo attachment. It's a normal finding. The second thing is that those that have a tongue tie, 90% of the time, based on the numbers, will also have an upper lip attachment that we're calling a lip tie, but it's actually just a normal anatomical you know, event. In fact, if you were to look at what's normal and abnormal, it's abnormal not to have the lip tethered. If you look at it anatomically, because it's only 10% that don't have that attachment. So, so, so that paper is a terrible paper, and any anybody that that that, that hasn't appreciated the flaws of that paper, um, I hope I can just uh, you know use this as an opportunity to open your eyes to that being the case. So, I just wanted to give you the a, a bit of a longer answer to that question, just in case you know that was there. Good. I think the um, next one has to do with the the removal of that note. So that's something you know very well. So I do. Uh, what do you? Uh, do when you remove them? Uh, are you yep. just shaving it structures or instead of complete the removal? Yep. What are you so about? let's talk about some practicality. So in terms of removing the tonsils, removing the tonsils, it, you know, surgically is easy because you can see them. They, they, you open the mouth, they're there. Everything that you need to see to perform the procedure is right in front of you. Um, and I'll come down to the different techniques, which is the second part of the question. But I just want to make that point because it reflects differently when it comes to the adenoids. Because the adenoids, you don't see them. You cannot see them. Um, when you know, if, if you take out any sort of, of, of instrumentation, whether it's a mirror or a telescope, okay, uh, in, in you know, whatever you want to nominate, in my whole ENT career looking at a patient, I have never seen the adenoids without the use of some form of tool or instrument to see them. You can't, you, they, they, you just can't see them. So, from that point of view, and you know, in their entirety. We see the adenoids in their entirety you cannot do it without the use of some sort of tool when it comes to removing the adenoids then it would make sense to your audience that we would look at the adenoids this is where life gets interesting because the standard technique for removing the adenoids is that you don't even look at what you're doing you do it blindly so you do it with the mouth open and you put a thing inside the mouth which is called a curette which is a little l-shaped instrument and at this end of the l-shaped instrument's a little square and that square goes ten these are the adenoids comes comes in handy sometimes all right and you're just scraping the adenoids blindly so in the mouth you'd be going basically like that if you can visualize that in two dimensions um to three um and then what you do is you put your finger inside the mouth but because of the orientation of where you're feeling if you think about what you've got to do with your finger to feel you're actually feeling with a glove you're feeling with your fingernail to see if the adenoids are gone. And the research shows that in around about uh, just under 70% of the time, the adenoids are still there. You know, you, you deliberately set to take them out, but 70% of the time they're still there. Um, quarter of the time they're there so much, they're actually still causing obstruction. So the standard technique doesn't work. So, so when I go in there to take the adenoids out, I do it under vision. And the adenoids, uh, again, in terms of differences, there is a problem with removing the adenoids. There is no clean surgical plane. So the, the great thing about surgery, as, as you know, from a dentistry point of view as well, is you, the, 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 we're blessed with these anatomical planes. The problem with the adenoids, with the adenoids to the back of the throat, there is no anatomical plane. There is no clean line in the sand. And we need to stop at some point because if we keep digging deeper and deeper, we're gonna hit the cervical spine which is not entirely on the high list of things we want to achieve in terms of doing this procedure. So we've got to mitigate our aggressiveness. So when I take them down, I take them down and, and, and flat with the intention and hope that I've, I've, I've removed them all. Um, but that's not always a given. Now there's one clinical scenario uh, where I will deliberately leave some of the adenoids behind and that is in children that have uh, a cleft palate um, either that's that's present or been repaired that the teaching is that you never remove the adenoids in kids that have had cleft palates because if you do so their palate won't be able to close the nasopharyngeal uh, inlet off properly and they'll get all sorts of problems and that's absolutely true but if you can visualize the adenoids which we can you can selectively remove some of the adenoid and give some relief but still leave um, some functional um, ad, you know adenoid soft palate there so you're finding a middle ground. So, you, so you're 
deliberately making an improvement without actually fixing the whole problem because if you fix the whole problem you create a, a, you know another disaster in the process so in the, in the mainstay the intention with adenoidectomy is, is to remove them all some techniques are better than others at doing that and and and, and the, the the important element of the technique is the visualization um, there's a, some form of, of, of looking rather than just going by blind feel with a glove finger and fingernail. So that's adenoidectomy. Uh, now tonsillectomy. So, so the, the, the question specifically relates to tonsillectomy versus, which is a, a, a full and total removal of the tonsils, versus a partial removal which is called a tonsillotomy. Now a tonsillotomy um, is where they are leaving a bit of the tonsil behind on the sidewalls of the throat. And to do that, there must be a good reason for doing it. And there are some excellent reasons for doing it, okay? The, the first excellent reason for doing it is that it, it, it hurts less. There is less pain. The recovery is so much better. So that, so that is a definite positive. So that makes sense. The next positive, which is absolutely true, is that you get less problems with bleeding afterwards. So, so the bane of our existence of taking tonsils out is that we have this raw surface in the throat and we've tried all sorts of tricks. You can throw whatever you want to throw at me. We've been there and done it all. We're still left with this, this cohort of patients that have bleeding afterwards that needs uh, medication, blood transfusion, surgery again, and occasionally there's a death from it. Okay, so you know, we don't take these decisions lightly, but in the mainstay, you know, we do okay. With a tonsillotomy, that bleeding is, is the chances are way, way lower. So again, a huge positive. You've got less pain, less bleeding. What's not to like? This is what's not like not to like. We need to look at if we're doing a partial removal, what is the potential downside to that is that the tonsils can grow back again. Is there anything in history that teaches us anything? And the answer is yes. I, I love going back in history. Tonsillotomy is not a new procedure. Tonsillotomy was done over a hundred years ago. They were deliberately doing this over a hundred years ago. And when someone was doing something and then it's they stopped doing it. You have to think they worked something out back then as to why it was a problem. They, you know, they would have been getting less pain and less bleeding, but for some reason that was mitigated by something else to the fact that they stopped doing it over a hundred years ago. And look, maybe the way we do it now, we've got you know techniques and technology, maybe they're not comparable. So what are we getting out of out of this? What we're getting out of this basically is a relapse rate over the sort of three year period of children having a tonsillotomy where they need to go back and have the, the procedure completed. Um, so that's another cost, that's another anesthetic to the patient, um, that's uh, you know, the, the risk of that, the, the, the full on procedure. Um, and if that's 20% of kids um, and so forth, and it means that we've only partly treated them and they've got ongoing airway problems um, that you know, might regress initially, but then start to progress later on, um, we're not doing this child any great favors. And the 20% of kids, that's a huge number. Um, you know, if, if we had a, a cancer treatment, I said, look, you can take cancer treatment number one, um, where it works 80% of the time, um, but 20% of the time, um, you know, the cancer is going to come back. Um, but the trade off is that you won't feel, you know, quite so terrible for two weeks, but, you know, it's only two weeks um, that you feel terrible for. Or we can give you the one where, um, you know, we've got a much better chance of success, but you're going to feel terrible for two weeks. Do you want to take the close to the 100% or the 80% for that two week time period trade off? And if I had cancer, I go, so you're telling me I'm going to feel really miserable and terrible for two weeks, but it's going to work a lot better compared to the other one. And with the, the other one, if it doesn't work down the track, 20% of the time I've still got the cancer and then I need to go and have that terrible one that you just told me about anyway. Let's just get it over and done with and do the terrible one. You know, and maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong in that mindset, but that's, that's, that's my approach. So I think anyone having these conversations needs to realize it is a recognized and accepted procedure. It definitely has the benefits, but you've got to look at what the downsides are too. So in my hands, um, I have no faith and confidence uh, that in my hands, I can deliver a good result with a tonsillotomy. Um, I have much greater faith and confidence that I can deliver results with a tonsillectomy. Uh, so that's what I do. Awesome, great. So let's go down the road here. We uh, Somebody asked about a test. Can you read that question from Cheryl LaFlame? Uh, can I just joke, I'm just reading it in order. Um, yeah. So if I look at order, I've got one from uh, Landry Clapp there, just oh, looking yes, yes. at, uh -huh. uh, is, that, is that okay? Because it'll help me yeah, keep go track. Ahead, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you view adenoidectomy tonsillectomy as a last resort for treating children? What about long-term consequences of these surgeries? They're, they're, these are great questions. So, um, again, and this is where people need to change, uh, or not, not change, people need to reflect on their thought process and paradigms, including myself. And and and, and if I, if what I say, say makes sense, um, and you can build on that, that's great. If you disagree, that's okay too. We have a situation where a child cannot breathe properly at night. We know from the science and research that any delay to relieving that obstruction leads to a high risk, and high risk is a 50-50 proposition, so 50% chance of having long-term consequences, particularly with regards to the neurological, the brain side of things, and the cardiovascular system. And the analogy I use, and I, and I, I, I run this analogy out so many times, if someone was coming into your child's bedroom at night and choking them, at what point do you want the choking to stop? And what measures would you take to achieve that? You would want that choking to stop straight away. You would take a an immediate response to stop it from happening. You would do whatever you could. And that is where surgery comes into the mix in the right cases. And, and I think, you know, I've got to be careful asking this question because it's a bit of a loaded question suggesting that tonsils and adenoids is the only thing. It's not the only thing, but let's just focus on where this question focus is. If a child has big tonsils and adenoids, get them out. Get them out as quick as you can, okay? Even if it doesn't completely fix the problem, get them out, okay? Deal with anything else that's contributing to it, but if tonsils and adenoids are part of the problem, get them out the way, okay? Um, you don't want to hang around. It's not the last resort, it's actually first line. In fact, pretty much for every kid, and this is part of the problem too, is what I'm about to say is part of the problem because what's, what, is, what is spilled out is, is first line treatment is tonsils and adenoids. You know, that's the first line treatment, but it's the, it, it, and it's because it works so well that it gets thrown around, but, but you know, we need to be more sophisticated. It needs to be the right treatment for the right problem. So for kids that have, if I had the qualification, obstructive tonsils and obstructive adenoids or one or the other or both, it is the first line treatment. There is nothing else to muck around with because you need an immediate relief of the situation. So it's not the last resort, it's the first line. If they've got small tonsils and small adenoids, well, again, you've got to weigh up what you're actually achieving um, if, if they're not actually obstructive. I mean, they, they, they drop down the list of options. It's not, it doesn't drop off the list completely, but it becomes way down the list. You start looking, all right, what else is actually causing this? Is it their myofunctional problems? Is it their, you know, their skeletal deficiencies? The next thing that's brought up, um, the long-term consequences of these surgeries. And, 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 and where this, in the mainstay, gets, gets uh, focused on is the immune system, okay? And, and, and this, is, this is a really good point to bring out. So let's deal with the adenoids first, because this is so easy. The adenoids disappear as you get older naturally. They naturally regress. So pretty much, not entirely, but pretty much every single adult walking around and listening to me talk right now does not have adenoids. The body doesn't use them. They have, therefore, zero contribution to my immune system. Right now, adenoids have zero contribution to my immune system. None whatsoever, because they're not there. Okay? So we're talking about something that naturally regresses over time. What about the tonsils? Okay. Um, if, in taking the tonsils out, people have looked at this really, really carefully, and because it, it is really important for us to know. Does it change the immune system? Um, the papers, except for two or three, the, the papers say no, it doesn't. The ones where it says it does change the immune system actually shows that their immune system is working better. And that's reflected on these children have less sick days. They recover from colds and illnesses better. And, and what people need to understand is that having big tonsils and adenoids is a reflection that the tonsils and adenoids are unhealthy. They are not contributing to health. They are detrimental to health. So it's a bit like if you have a tooth that is the, the rotten and decayed, you know, you sort of preach or don't extract teeth, don't extract teeth. You know, you know, what's the consequences of extracting a tooth? What's the consequence of leaving a, you know, terribly de decayed, um, diseased uh, tooth that is beyond repair and salvage? Um, 
all sorts of problems. You know, you don't think twice. You go, that tooth's going to cause a lot more problems there. Let's get it out. It's the same with this scenario. So I think it's, it's really important, first of all, to realise how tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy as, as procedures fit into the sequence of things. You know, it's got to be more focused towards where it's the problem. Um, and then in terms of long-term consequences, the, the, the research shows it doesn't. Now, someone might be a student enough to pick out the, the research that came from Sweden where they looked at, a, at, at about a million people, uh, looked at their populations and looked at their tonsils were coming out and said, oh, they're getting more asthma, uh, they're getting uh, more, more chest infections, those sorts of things. The problem with that data set, if you look at it, is they had a lot of missing data. Um, the, the, it wasn't actually a million people, um, it was 700. And when you actually look at the data, what they found is that people that had their tonsils out between when they had them out to the age of 30-ish, um, probably had three or four more colds in that entire 25-ish years than those people that didn't have their tonsils out. So we're talking about a condition that affects the brain irreversibly with damage because of low oxygen levels versus having three or four colds more to the age of 30. Um, it, it's a pretty good trade-off at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that addresses mm -hmm. that one. I've got uh, Sarah there. Hey, Sarah. Um, okay, best test you can have done to know that blocks the nose throat area do, 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 is dice. All right, excellent question. So let's go through dice. I'm going to tear this one apart too, unfortunately, but it's, it's all good. DICE stands for Drug Induced Sleep Endoscopy, okay? What it involves is that an ENT surgeon using uh, the flexible telescopes that we have that allow us to visualise the whole upper air digestive tract um, from the nostril through the nasal passage to the nasopharynx, down to the oropharynx, down into the hypopharynx and the larynx, and we can keep going if we want, we can go you know, down to the trachea and so forth, but we can visualise the whole upper airway with our telescope. And what people uh, evolved to doing was doing, well, why don't we, you know, use that to look at people with sleep apnea? Makes perfect sense. So we'd get them in the office and we have a look and then so forth. But people said, yeah, but they're awake. Um, you know, when you're asleep, the muscles relax, things change. So people sort of then evolved to saying, well, why don't we do this in hospital, give them an anaesthetic, put them to sleep, and have a look while they're asleep. And, and this is where we made a huge mistake because being under an anaesthetic is not being asleep. Asleep is a physiological state that has certain elements of brainwave activity and muscle function and breathing and everything that integrates with that. Having an anaesthetic is turning the brain off. They are not the same, they are not comparable. So it's actually, it's really wrong to call it a sleep endoscopy. It's not. What it is, is it's drug-induced airway obstruction. That's what it is. And then why is that potentially a problem? Well, we tease it out. When we go and get people that are snoring at home and we do an acoustic analysis of that snoring, and then we do the same person in hospital under the anaesthetic with this drug-induced airway obstruction, and we listen to the acoustics of the noises that they make, they're different. So we actually are not replicating their airway obstruction acoustically, uh, and acoustically means that the noise is made because of different uh, points of obstruction. So there's your first problem. Your second problem with this drug-induced sleep endoscopy is that if you give anyone enough of a drug, their airway will obstruct. So then people started mucking around with the doses and saying, oh, you need to have this sort of magic dose. This is the, you know, the magic dose that, that, that works. Um, that's just the magic dose that induces the airway obstruction to the point that they can still actually be breathing at the same time as obstructing rather than sedating them so much that you need to take the breathing over for them. That's all it does is this puts you into that window of breathing with, you know, sedation still with breathing. The next problem is it's done with them lying on their back, okay? So it's only been done in that one body position. Um, people have started to then explore that and, and roll them over to their side and you see something different. It looks different. All of a sudden it's different. It's not the same thing. Uh, so, you know, the, these are all the problems with drug-induced, you know, so-called sleep endoscopy. Uh, 
I, 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 I tell you now, I've been there. I've done that. I, there are still people that do it. All good due credit to them. Again, in my hands, it's a waste of time. It, you know, from the evidence and science point of view, it, it, it does not stack up. It, and from a, you know, directing treatment point of view and, and so forth, um, you know, people, you know, say they get great results. I just never got them. So again, that, that, that's my take on it, just being aware of it. Um, and then, sorry, the other thing I should just point out is depending on which drug you give them, you'll get different types of airway obstruction. So when you have a situation that varies with just the, simple, the nature of the drug that you give and the dose that you give and the position that they're lying in, and then the noise that they make is not the same as the noise that they make at home, there's, there's some, so, such fundamental flaws with the whole idea of it um, that, that, again, just, just be a little bit objective and, and, and look at it. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it really is pretty useless um, in terms of, um, you know, scientifically, um, being validated, you know, if you're going to be objective about it. Okay, good. So the next one is a comment by Dr. William Harrell, and uh, it's very, very true what he says. He's worked with one of the pioneers in our in our field, which is Dr. Yeah. Farrar. Uh, I use a, a Farrar appliances as well. Um, we there's a lot of politics involved in how people talk in dentistry, and I use the word CR to 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 uh, talk to the rest of my colleagues, even though we are using an anterior position in splint. Uh, as you understand, you know, from your point of view as an ENT, we, these people have very distalized condyles, uh, and they need to be repositioned anteriorly. Uh, so those splints work, work very, very well, and Dr. Farrar was one of the pioneers and invented this, and it works very, very well. Uh, the definition of CR has changed over the years, and basically, uh, if you want to say it in very simple terms, is you're going to have space distally and enough space for the for the for the uh, for the disc to fit in place and not be anteriorly displaced or partially displaced anterior immediately displaced so um this it's very true what he says i i, I noticed dr murphy that's also on the call I totally agree with dr harold which i do as well um it's just sometimes terminology that you use to be politically correct with certain groups so I use the yeah. CR term, even though we're using an interior reposition of appliance. So uh, 100% uh, agree uh, on what Dr. William Harrell says here. He's yeah. actually had the privilege of work with Dr. Farrar for a period of time uh, when before he died. So that's a wonderful yeah. uh, historical reference there as well. Yeah, I, look, I, I've been I've been very lucky that that um, that that um, Bill has Bill, Bill has come across my table. Um, which, you know, probably from the book and everything else. Anyone that's listening, all right, you know, if you want to sort of just, just hear from me, this is not scripted. He's going to hate me for saying this. Um, if, if, if anyone ever gets the opportunity, and I don't even know if he offers this opportunity, okay, but if anyone ever gets the opportunity to go visit him in his office or, or, or sit in any talks or anything he's doing, you will walk away with so much information, so much knowledge and so much insight. Um, it will not be a waste of your time, uh, you know, in the slightest. I mean, his, 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 his experience with these people that are the historical people um, and his, his own exploration and knowledge, um, you know, you know, when you walk into a room and, and you go, he's one of the smart guys in the room, he's one of those smart guys in the room. Um, so, so for those that, that um, you know, if he offers any of those opportunity, and he's probably going to back, back slap me now if I put my foot in it, but honestly i mean you, you, you would not you would not be a, a, a put out a step in terms of, of, of just absorbing what he's got to, to, to hear and say and share awesome. so there you go you got you got you, you got to, you got to pump up there bill um let me have a look uh at what age can the tonsils and adenoids be removed any age the youngest i've done is 11 months the long, youngest i know was six weeks of age the oldest that i've done is 87 years of age there's, there's no there's, there's no rule you know again use that analogy if you someone is choking your child at night how old do you want that your child to be before you ask that person to leave the room are you are you, are you worried about how old your child is um, if someone is choking them at night to determine when it's the right time to ask that person to leave the room you want an immediate relief of the problem we know from 
uh, independent research, but the, the really good one has been the Canadian research. Um, the the, the, the so-called acronym is CHILD, um, um, where they looked at uh, you know sleep disordered breathing, and, and, it, and it brought everything together. Basically, any child, you know, that basically the younger it starts and the longer it goes for, the worse their outcomes are going to be. The worst uh, outcomes we get are if it starts before 18 months of age, the next time point otherwise is before the age of six, and anything, at, regardless of the age that it starts, that goes for longer than six months, those children end up in the worst outcome category um, on a statistical you know, averaging of, of, of the numbers. So the moral of the story um, is get in and get in early. Um, Majid um, has asked about um, the takeaway points. Um, look, there's, there's so much that you could take away from this. And then because I know that you're an educated, learned um, audience um, already, I, I, I don't know that I would say anything that would possibly change things dramatically. But all, all I would, would, would want to commend as, as, as you get the opportunity is make airway screening just a routine part of your patient um, questionnaire. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever sort of dental clinic that you run, whatever you do, um, you have a prime opportunity to be a, a, a sentry, a guardian at the gate, um, and 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 pick up these problems and say, no, 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 you got to turn around and you got to go back to the ENT. You don't belong in here. Um, you can come in here later. You need to go to the ENT first. And the reason you need to go to the ENT because the parents are looking at you it's just like you just came in for a dental hygiene check, what, what's going on, we're all bewildered, you can explain and say, look, you know, we look out for these problems, you know, the reason we look out for these problems is because we know the type of dental problems we see later on um, are much less, you know, if this is going to help not just your child and, and you know, the, the, the ways it helps them, it's going to help them from a dental point of view too, everybody's going to win out of this. So that'd be the first thing and just, just, just and, but keep it simple, you know, you, you can make simple things very complicated and you can make complicated things very simple. So keep it simple. Do they snore? Do they mouth breathe? Do they stop breathing at night? Yes, fine, ENT. Simple, okay? It really is very simple. Um, you can go the next level and you can be sophisticated and, and so forth, um, but you don't have to if you don't want to, okay? Um, so so takeaway messages, um, you know, in, in a nutshell is teamwork, get the right ENT and find these kids so we can fix them. That, 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 that would be me throwing it um, in a nutshell. Uh, the next one I've got, and I'll have to be honest, I'm going to have trouble answering it because I'm not sure that I'm, I'm fully understanding it. Inflamed adenoids could be healed after orthodontic. Oh, sorry, no, I apologize, I do understand it. Inflamed adenoids could be healed under orth, after orthodontic treatment. Um, there's no evidence that that's the case. Uh, the adenoids are inflamed and healthy as best as we can tell. As it is because of a chronic viral infection that the adenoids continue to fight against. Um, that's why antibiotics don't work. Um, it's why nasal steroid sprays have some effect because of their anti-inflammatory effect, but you're just band-aiding the problem. If a child, and I, want to, I want to go back, way back when I was rambling, if a child has an airway problem, for example, because of large adenoids, get them out. Just get them out. If they need, need the jaw and orthodontic stuff done, fine, progress with that. But do it in a situation where you have a child that has the ability to function properly. If you are trying to orthodontically correct a child that has large adenoids and is forced to mouth breathing, then you are pushing against the forces of nature that are against you in the process. Get them unblocked. Set yourself up for success. Make life easy for yourself rather than try and do it the hard way. Take the easy road. Um, would be, you know, that in a nutshell. So I, I'm hoping that I've, I've uh, got that. What are, you what, Sorry, are you comments, what are your comments on the tonsils? Uh, we have adults that have tonsils uh, yep. because they're mouth breeders still. And um, yep. I've, seen, I've seen some of my patients improve tremendously with malfunctional training and reestablishing nose breathing when, when they have a functional nose, assuming they have a functional nose. Yeah, that's your first problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> So, so do you do you see? Uh, I mean, you probably don't get to see those patients. Obviously, you you do surgeries mo most of the time, but um, I, I see I, I see these people. Did you see those people? So, so do you yeah. feel those people could improve if they're borderline 
you know, let's say they're mouth breeders and then they can be yep. retrained by a monofunctional uh, therapist to start breathing through their their uh, nose again, knowing that they're they have a, 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 a you know a, a patent nose. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen many patients with with tonsils that have actually you know diminished in size quite a bit just by doing that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we've got to be careful because we, we we unless we keep track of numbers, we can we can lose track of what we're actually seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and we tend to remember the ones that impress us, and we tend to forget about the ones that were neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at my numbers, so I, and I did this specifically in, in, in pediatrics, and I'll come to the adults in a sec. So when I looked at pediatrics, I looked at 10 years of, of, of data. And what I found is that those that um, had big tonsils tended to be mouth breathers. But mm -hmm. those that were mouth breathers tended not to have big tonsils. So the big tonsils were actually causing mouth breathing. Mouth breathing wasn't in the mainstay causing big tonsils. So I think it's important to realize it wasn't a, a two-way street. The other thing, just to sort of come back to it, is that I see a huge number of adults that have a blocked nose and their tonsils are perfectly normal. And I know that because if they had normal tonsils, I'd be fixing their nose and their tonsils as well. The number of patients where I need to fix their nose and their tonsils as well is, is, is really quite small. So I have a huge number of adults with blocked noses that are mouth breathers that have perfectly normal tonsils. Uh, do we have a scenario then, as you've alluded to, where, you know, the nose um, is then, you know, made to work? Um, you know, if it was blocked, the ENT fixes it and then it's rehabilitated, as you've alluded to. And if they happen to have tonsil problems, that the tonsil problems can regress? Sure, that can happen. But I don't leave that to chance. I fix their nose and I bring them back in three or four months to see where we've got to. And in my experience, most of the time, the tonsils end up having to come out as well. So there's some that regress and you go, hey, this is great. We dodged that bullet. We don't need to do that one. But the majority of my numbers where I turning up with dual pathology, managing one, reassessing the second, most of the time they're getting, you know, both sorted because the second being the big tonsils did not resolve. Um, that's not to say, you know, sometimes it does and you'll remember those ones, but um, that's, that's that's just my experience. And, you know, just because it's my experience doesn't mean it's real world for everyone else, but I only know what I know from 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 you know where I've been and what I've done. Well, while we're in that su uh, subject, uh, Dr. Nabil Tavara, the president of the Canadian chapter, is asking us a question: What's what's the role of of, of myofunctional therapy and maxillary expansion in these situations? Yep. Excellent. What are your thoughts on that? Huh? Yep. All right. So you're making me jump around on the questions. That I've got them in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You're in I'm charge. Same I'm, subject there. There I'm, I'm told. Yeah. No. No. You're you're absolutely right. Okay. So again, so when this this is my approach okay when i see a child i'm not looking for just tonsils and adenoids i'm looking for allergies i'm looking for deviated septums i'm looking for skeletal deficiencies i'm looking for tongue tie and i'm looking for suggestions that there's myofunctional dysfunctions okay and then depending on what their pathology is dictates what the treatment plan is going to be and for some people it's going to be surgery for some people it's going to be allergy doctors for some people it's going to be medication uh, for some people it's going to be dental and there's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a whole recipe there in terms of those ingredients. But I lay it out in a stepwise fashion. And most of the time it is stepwise. Sometimes it's concurrent. But if I see a child that's got, for example, significant nasal allergies, significantly blocked nose, um, narrow maxilla um, and so forth, um, you know, skeletal deficiencies that go with that. My first job as an ENT is to get that person to breathe. And I will potentially try doing that with medication, the nasal steroid spray, bring them back after two months. And if I've been successful and got the nose clear, then they are a suitable candidate for myofunctional therapy and a suitable candidate for expansion because they've got a functional airway. If they come back after two months and they're still blocked and they're still mouth breathing, then I'll go and operate on them. And I'll do whatever I need to do surgically to make the most of the space that's available. But as I'll often tell the parents, and, I, and I've, I've had this in other videos, so I'll, I'll replicate it for everyone here. If this is the maxilla, this is my top jaw, this is my nose, all right? Those with the narrow maxilla, that's their nasal space. If we throw the turbinates into the mix, okay, that's what they got, okay? And not necessarily because they've got big turbinates, they've just got less space, okay? So I know that that can be expanded, but I go back to what I said before. 
we've got to get them an airway quickly. The clock is already ticking. Okay, and I know there's rapid maxillary expansion versus, um, you know, alternative types of expansion. And, and personally, and I'm not a dentist, I'm not a fan of, of, of RME. Um, I, I think it's aggressive, it causes other problems and, and, and so forth. Um, and I have issues about how stable it is, but that's that's just me, I'm not a dentist. We're not, we, we totally agree with you on that. Yeah, we're, okay, we're, 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 look, I'm not a dentist, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, we, I'm, not here, I'm not here to argue dentistry. No, I'm just we, telling we, you we, I know we, this. And, and but I don't like it. So yeah, we're talking we, about you know, a phase of expansion. But during that phase of expansion, you have a child that's obstructed. Um, and then so so from that point of view, you know, so look, you know, we can start the jaw and the, start the orthodontic stuff um, on the premise that we're going to have a functional airway um, in a time frame of three months. Um, and so what I mean by that is that if I saw a child today um, and I was going to start them on medication, I'm going to see them in two months, and if they're still blocked. Um, and then we're going to operate, but the operation may be delayed for another two months just because of scheduling, for example. So that's four months. Then I would say, look, you can start this orthodontic stuff, but you know the time frame that I've got from now to when we might need to do surgery to give them the airway if the medication hasn't hit in, in two months is four months. So don't start the orthodontics for at least another month so that if you do start it, that three month when you're starting coincides with when the surgery kicks in. Um, I think anything outside of three months, in my humble opinion and, and, and vague experience, is it just doesn't work as well. And that's what the dentists are telling me to. And the same thing goes for my functional therapy. If you break your leg, okay, the orthopedic surgeon comes and fixes the leg, and the physiotherapist or physical therapist is your rehab option, we all get that. It makes perfect sense, okay? But you don't start physical therapy until the fracture is fixed and stable and suitable for progress. And, and this is, again, something I think people really need to understand in terms of how these things end up you know, in front of us. When a child, for whatever reason, has an airway obstruction, they end up having to make compensations for it. You know, and making a compensation does not equate to dysfunction. The consequences can be dysfunctional, but if, you, know, you have to compensate. So if I'm deaf in this ear and I have to compensate by doing that to hear you, okay, that is a sensible compensation for my dysfunction. So it makes sense that I would do that. So you don't rehab me, me, you know, posture-wise by saying, no, no, look straight, because I know I then can't function properly. So when children are obstructed, if you're trying to use my functional therapy to rehab them whilst they're still obstructed, you are swimming against the tide. And the brain is really, really smart. It knows that this is not a successful proposition. As a consequence of that, it won't let it happen. It'll say, this is a waste of time. This is not gonna work. And then seeing the myofunctional therapist, you know, they might be using, you know, oral appliances and, you know, things and, you know, the kids are not tolerating, they're not using the saying, oh, well, they're not compliant. You know, no, the kids are actually just working out how to survive. What you're imposing upon them is actually counterproductive to their survival. Your objective is not the same as theirs. So you need to get yours on the same page. And to do that, the first thing you need to do is have a functional airway, and then you need to give it three months. And this is where people get really mucked up again, because getting the nose unblocked, getting the adenoids out, you know, plumbing-wise, oh, it's unblocked. That doesn't make it work straight away. Okay. If you are at a city at the bottom, you know, and, and you have a water supply. Up, you know, a lake on a mountain, okay, and and, and that pipe that connects the two um, has got blocked at the top, okay. You send a crew up to unblock it, and they get the water flowing. That water doesn't turn up in the town as soon as they unblock it. It's got to have a time period where it transitions through. It's the same thing, is that when you unblock a nose, it even though it is unblocked, it does not work physiologically straight away. There are a whole lot of subtle physiological changes that happen within that nose that take about three months. And I know this because it's my PhD, um, that take about three months before that nose is actually going to be functioning properly. So again, the brain is going to be aware that it's not working properly. And if you try and force something, so I always tell parents, um, give it three months. If after three months, we haven't got resolution of things, that's when we can start bringing things into the mix um, otherwise. But give it that reset period first because we do not want to introduce a treatment to the brain that the brain is going to be uncomfortable with and going to reject, uh, reject and, and not proceed with.
So I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm answering the, the question that's been there. It, everything has its place. Everything has its place um, from a timing point of view as well. Okay. So let's go on to the next question. Uh, which uh, screen tool do you like best? All right, I'm going to cheat on you there. I'm actually going to use it in my order because you've jumped a few. So I've got <laughs> one. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, why do most ENTs not fix uh, a breathing problem? Uh, I'll go back to what I said before. Are they a breathing ENT? Okay. I don't. Why? Why? Why don't I fix throat cancer? Because I'm not a throat cancer ENT. Simple. So if you are having the experience with your ENT is not fixing these things, you are using the wrong sort of ENT. That, that, that is actually the answer. Um, you, you've got to go back and do your homework and find the right ENT. I, I, you know, that, 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 I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you, we, we've got to stop talking about ENTs like they're all the same. Uh, now, Bill's there with another comment. Is one of your goals tonsillectomy besides with it to help Mouth breathe become a nose breathe, and if so, what is the role? Oh, all right, sorry, I asked that question. Sorry, yep, you just rephrased it. Uh, which sleep screening tool do you like? Um, yep, I people need to understand that I don't use a sleep screening tool uh, because being a being a specialist, um, I have people out there that are doing the screening for me. I, I'm basically the person that comes to because people have found a problem. And I know there's all sorts of sleep questionnaires out there, um, you know, the PSQ, the bears and all those sorts of things. And they're, they're really, really good. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're good from a clinical point of view. They're good from a research point of view. Um, you, you made reference to my book, Snore to I put my own checklist together because I wanted to be, this is more than just about breathing. You know, if you're gonna be out there screening for, you know, breathing problems, well, hey, look, hell, I'm gonna give you all the other ENT stuff too while we're at it. Screen them for ear infections. Um, you know, screen them you know, for um, tonsillitis. Screen them for hay fever. Screen them for allergy. If we're going to, you know, one in, all in. Um, you know, here's an opportunity. It's just a tick box thing. You know, those who've got the book, comes with the book. You just tick the box, tick, 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 um, as to what, um, you know, it, 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 things to ask about. And what are those things that, you know, if I dumb it down, I'll go back to what I said before, talking about kids. Do they mouth breathe? Do they snore? Do they stop breathing at night? To be honest, you don't need to ask another single question if you get a yes to those things. And if you're asking that up front, you don't need to think about how can I blink stuff to you. But you know, what are they turning up for? Teeth grinding. Okay, think airway because it's low oxygen levels. Malocclusion. Think mouth breathing. Think airway. They're turning up with uh, gingival disease. Think mouth breathing. Think airway. They're turning up with early dental caries. Think mouth breathing, think airway. So, um, you know, you can start screening for airway problems once you've identified the dental problem, or you could have got in the front end before you even physically see them. You've already got a questionnaire filled out um, that's, you know, three simple questions. All right. If you want to just deal with the airway bit, forget about everything else, you're going to pick up 80, 90% of those airway question, you know, things just with those three simple questions. Um, and for a clinic that's busy, that doesn't want to make this main focus, um, you know, that's a good intro point. Um, and then once you start doing it and then you start realizing, holy hell, I've been missing all these cases, all these kids over all these years have been coming through and I've been missing them. And now I'm picking them up and we're getting them to the ENT and this ENT is great because they actually will listen to me and they're actually fixing these kids and they're fixing these kids. And these parents are absolutely delighted because in the whole lifetime of this child, nobody could put two and two together. The parents knew something was wrong. You sent them in the right direction and got them sorted, and this is what they got. Um, you're a hero. Um, so, so yeah. So, you, to be honest, you can pick and choose whatever questionnaire that you want to use that you find works best for you, for the type of patients that you see, because you may not see kids, you may be seeing adults, and you can moderate it and so forth. Yeah. Um, if you want to then you know up up the ante and ask more questions and get more insight to get more understanding, sure, go for it. But to be honest, that's the ENT's job at the end of the day. Right. It's, it's funny, you mentioned the bears, and we, we're going to have Judith calling uh, Dr. Judith Owens, I'm sorry, uh, as one of our speakers in our our, our, um, our symposium pretty soon. You, you guys will get some information on that. So if you guys are interested in listening about the subject, uh, stay tuned so we, you can um, uh, find out the lineup of speakers we're going to have for the next uh, our next virtual meeting that we'll have in a, in a few months. 
uh, let's let's go down the road. See, if we have any more any more questions here? Yeah, wanna... we've got a really good one here because uh, I've reflected on this. Um, do I get a, do I skip a sleep study? All right, we've got to you've got to realize there's a few differences here in terms of healthcare models. Okay, so I know that in the United States, with some of your your health insurers, they make it a requirement for a child to have a sleep study before they will fund a tonsillectomy for sleep apnea. So that's that 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 and that's that that's not a clinical thing. That's that's just insurance company stuff. Mm -hmm. Throw that out for the moment. Let's talk about reality. Sleep disordered breathing, okay, could be mouth breathing. Sleep study is normal. Could be snoring. Sleep study is normal. Could be upper airways resistance syndrome. Sleep study is normal. Sleep apnea. Sleep study is abnormal. So if we are using uh, the sleep study to determine which children we need to fix, the only children we're going to fix on the sleep disorder breathing spectrum would be those with sleep apnea. We already know they've got sleep apnea because the parents can take a video on their phone and bring it in and show, look, they snore and they stop breathing. You go, yeah, they do. So I can honestly and genuinely count on my fingers how many kids I have sent off for a sleep study before surgery to determine the want need or otherwise for surgery and i don't need all of my fingers to do it and i'm talking over 20 years of doing this and and if you look at um, what's out there the guidelines on sleep studies are mostly written by the people that actually run sleep labs so they're saying that you need to come to our sleep lab and have this test done um, when you actually look at what the ents then go and do most of them just go and fix the problem and then if there is a residual problem then yeah, we'll absolutely go and get the things measured and assessed to see if there's other sleep pathology going on, other obstructions and so forth and, and, and so on and so forth from that point of view. The purpose of a test is because it affects management. If I have a child that has sleep disorder breathing and I can see that they're obstructed, I don't need a sleep study to know that they're obstructed and I don't need a sleep study to tell me that I need to unblock them. Um, so long story short, um, sleep studies, um, if you look at it scientifically and objectively and rationally, um, in a, in a clarify this in an otherwise normal child. So I'm talking about a child that is not complicated like Down syndrome or craniofacial problems or um, cerebral palsy or other sort of neurological conditions. Otherwise normal child walks in off the street, big tonsils, big adenoids, just get them out. You, you just, you, you know, the sleep study is not going to change the fact that that's going to be your decision. Um, so hopefully I, 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 I've answered that one. Uh, the question is about the Muller maneuver. You're absolutely right there, Mohammed. Um, so instead of uh, the dice, which is the, the sleep one, we can do the awake one in the office. We can do them with them sitting up, lying down. And when we've looked at that, that actually is pretty good. And actually the thing that I use mostly to guide whether someone would be a good candidate for a, some form of uh, mandibular advancement splint for their upper airway obstruction, because I can see what effect moving the mandible does um, with the pressure changes of breathing with the Muller maneuver. For those that don't know what a Muller maneuver is, um, it's where we have the telescope in through the nose. We pitch their nose, so we get an air seal and we get them to breathe in. And as you're breathing in, you get a negative pressure and we can see is the throat closing down on itself. And then we pull their mandible forwards and does it stay open or not? And if I have a patient who is sitting upright, fully awake, full muscle tone, telescope down, mandible forwards, okay, and you can play with phonetic positions and, and, and you know, all those sorts of things. I know all about that, but, you know, just, just bear with me, keep it simple. If that person is sitting upright, full muscle tone, mandible forwards, and their airway still closes and collapses, there is not a splint in the world that's going to help them. Because what's it going to do when they're asleep when it's not even going to do it when they're awake? So I can uh, find, um, you know, the, the successful ones. Um, um, you know, uh, you know well, the likely successful ones, but I could also pick the ones that are probably going to be outright failures for a mandibular advancement splint just by simply doing that look. Um, Nabil's uh, piped up again there. Uh, relapse, and relapse. Yeah, all right. This is really good because so, somebody um, brought this to me this morning uh, with a paper and, and, and so forth. And, I, 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 and the paper was along the lines of Kids were having their tonsils and adenoids out, and then down the track, 68% of them had relapsed. What I pointed out to that person, and then they said, and the reason that mostly they had relapsed is because they had allergies or they're overweight. 
what I pointed out to them and said, right, so these people have identified that these kids from the beginning have coexisting pathology, such as allergy, overweight, obesity. And they're telling me that the surgery didn't work. That is an absolute nonsense. If I have an accident and I break both my arms, but we only fix one of them, then I'm still left with an arm that's no good. Okay. And, but to say that fixing the other arm didn't work because the other arm wasn't fixed, it doesn't make sense. And this is exactly the same thing. If, and this is what I keep saying. You know, if a child has more than one pathology, you cannot expect an adenotonsillectomy to fix everything. You, can, you just can't. Um, and then you sort of look from the, you know, the myofunctional therapy point of view uh, and so forth. Um, you've got to look at, you know, what are their sort of long-term groups, you know, where the, which kids, um, you know, respond, rehab and do well. Um, you know, the research shows at the end of the day, two thirds of them, right? And this is two thirds unselected, just t cookie, you know, cut a template approach. They got sleep apnea, whatever, sleep disorder breathing, tonsils, adenoids, didn't think about it, 80% got better, and within that, 20% relapse overall got better with, with no great sense of insight or management. It's that 20% failure. Why did they fail? Well, they failed either because you didn't do the procedure properly or you missed something um, or, you know, they need, need other things. They need the myofunctional therapy. They need the orthodontics. Um, you know, so, so everything has its place in terms of what needs to be sequenced. Um, not every child needs tonsils and adenoids out. Not every child needs some form of orthodontics. Not every child needs myofunctional therapy. Not every child needs combinations of those. Some people just need single modality treatment. Some kids need multi-modality treatment. Um, and then, you know, th this is the thing is we try and generalize and try and say, look, we've got to take tonsils and adenoids and do myofunctional therapy for everyone. It's not true. And it's not true because we don't need to do surgery for everyone. And it's not true because we don't need to do myofunctional therapy for, for everyone. And those that do myofunctional therapy, if you get up with, upset with me saying that, well, then, you, you know, I just said we don't need to do surgery all the time. So, so you know, I'm already throwing myself under the bus. I'm not throwing you under the bus. I'm not throwing myself under the bus. I'm being realistic. Um, we need to get a better feeling and understanding for this and better teamwork and work out, all right, who are these kids? You know, we need to move away from um, generalised to precision-based care. You know, what is it? What are the features that we can find in this group of kids that mean, yeah, they are the myofunctional therapy kids. Um, you know, they are the ones that we might as well just book them in three months now because they're going to need it. You know, we just do not have that that level of sophistication. So in the meantime, absolutely advocate everything and anything that can do do to help these kids, uh, but at the same time, um, be aware that we're going to keep learning and we're going to keep changing. And, and, and we never want to be in a situation where we say that we always have to do something because, you know, one person is not the same as the next. Um, we, we need to moderate it to, to, to match the person in front of us, not just to suit our own agendas. You know, my agenda being a surgeon would be to operate. Um, not every kid that comes in front of me needs an operation. Already, I think we kind of covered all the all the answers. To have, all the questions, have we? Uh, Nabil's got one one tail in there. It's a, mate, the, you've got such great people here. They are such fantastic. <laughs> people. But the problem is with these fantastic questions, it makes me rave on for another twenty minutes. So let me let me make this one really quick and simple. Okay, maxillary expansion is not the equivalent of enlarging the nasal fossa. Right, so by the nasal fossa, I'm going to interpret that to mean the nasal cavity. Just, just, just. Hopefully, I'm right because otherwise, I'm going to struggle to get the answer. Um, hundred percent agree with you. It's not the same. Um, when we look at uh, maxillary expansion in, in its traditional sense, which is a lateral expansion, okay, we'll, we'll come into. We'll do it now. You need AP as well. You need anterior. Mm -hmm. But let's just go back a step. You know, the whole concept was all about lateral expansion. That was a you know, take it forwards, and we'll get a make. You know, we go from this, and we'll get. The, the maxilla will come down, and then as a result of the maxilla coming down, the nose will open up. Great in theory. We go and measure it, nasal capacity is exactly the same. It didn't change. What did change, which is interesting, is nasal resistance decreased. 
And the, the, the reality is that we have to take a far more intellectual and sophisticated approach to this than, than what we've done in the past. And the reason for that is because of fluid dynamics. Um, you can have something with the same cross-sectional area, but depending on its shape, it will have a different level of resistance. So I could have a, a, you know, a circle like this with whatever cross-section that is. I could have something that's super flat like this, but elongated for a mile. And its cross-sectional area could be the same as that. Huge difference how something's going to flow through it. So it's not about the cross-sectional area of volume in its own right, but also what configuration it takes. So this is where we get the sort of computational fluid dynamics that's out there um, with the guys that are into sort of those girls, um, not, not, not being um, gender specific, um, you know, people out there um, that, that do um, you know, these sorts of calculations um, can show us up on and sort of say, you know what? Yeah, you've decreased the resistance because you've changed the shape of it. Okay, you've gone from something like this to something like that. Your volume's exactly the same. You're measuring the volume, it's exactly the same, but it works better because it actually is shaped differently. Um, but the big thing we've learned is that it's not just about taking it out, you've got to bring it forwards. So I don't want to get buried in that one because it's sort of on the, the, the tail end of things. Um, and then um, I think I think we've hit the question. So ho hopefully, um, yeah. We've still got some people that haven't, you know, well, they're still pretending that they're online if they're not really online. Yeah, they're not, they're yeah. not well, I, I, I told you. Go ahead, Carlos. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I was going to tell, I, I, told, I, I told everybody you will wear us out. Uh, I think we lost about yeah. 10 people, but this is so interesting, um, David, that we, we love listening to you. Uh, it was very insightful. You're, you're, you're very modest when you say you don't understand much about dentistry and when people really know, realize how much you know about dentistry, uh, the things uh, that you have inside your mind, uh, they'll, they'll, um, it's, it's just incredible. Uh, you it, guys it, probably... It's a scary place <laughs> inside my mind, Carlos. But, 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 but I'm truthful and honest. You know, I am yeah. not dentally trained. Okay. You know, I, 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 you know, I, you know, I, I, I might sound very clever because I can use some clever, you know, words and, you know, those sorts of things. And, you know, hopefully half the time I'm using them correctly, but, but I, I want to be honest and genuine. Okay. I, I, I am not dentally trained. Yes. No, um, we understand I, that, but, but, but not, if not we had, yeah. skill that I don't have. Yeah. We, if, if we had ENTs with the understanding you have a dentistry and the things that we can do, it, we would be able to work much better. Uh, we just have to find the right people. I, I, I wish you could, you, you could start an association or a group like we have of ENTs like you that we can all start, you know, uh, finding relationships with that would be awesome. My, my, uh, my colleagues are trying to kick me out of ENT, mate. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm swimming against the tide of convention here. That yeah. um, well, we we I come back to it. it it's evidence based. You know, yeah. I, I, I could be some raving lunatic making us making stuff up, and then that would be a concern. Um, the problem is, I, I, I just keep I just keep referencing the literature, and it's it's pretty hard. You know, to to shut me up when when I, I, I've, I've got that in my back pocket okay well thank you very much for such insight uh some people were asking about a pdf uh, in, in case you guys didn't know we it was just a conversation today I, I would love for you to come back one one day either virtually or in live in the future i gotta tell you so so you know i i i turned up to dallas as, a, as a, we were talking preliminary I turned up to dallas Fort Worth did did my talk on the uh, Saturday, the Sunday morning, uh, three a.m. Sunday morning. I had a message from uh, a friend here in Australia to say that our government was uh, shutting the borders down, um, and that uh, we've got two weeks to get back before um, um, we, we basically can't come back. So I literally booked a plane out that Sunday night, um, having with the plan of being there for two weeks. I was going to be in you know in in, in Texas for two weeks. Um, I, I am, am getting sorely uh, frustrated by the fact that I have all these people on Facebook posting these beautiful places like Montana. I got a bill down there in Alabama. You know, I got, I, got, I, I have such an affection for, for the, the, the country and the people um, within the United States um, that I, you do not need to encourage me to come back. Um, you know, anyone that's listening, anyone that wants me to turn up somewhere, it, it, it's a really simple deal. And the same for Canada, by the way, Sarah. You're not getting off the hook. I love Canada too. It's a really simple deal. 
you put it together, you invite me, um, you show me a good time, you show me the place, you, you introduce me, you know, to, to the sights and sounds of, 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 of where you are and where you live. Um, that, that, that makes my heart sing. I, I just love it. Okay. Well, we appreciate very much the time you spent with us today, David. It, it was wonderful. Uh, next time you come in Dallas, please don't don't do give me a call. Oh yeah, I would love, no. love to see you again in, in person. Hopefully, one yeah. one of these days we'll go back to those things. And um, we're looking forward to to, to listen from you in the in, in the future. No problems. And look, and, and thank you guys for the opportunity. I mean, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of faith and trust to sort of bring people like me on, on onto your network and forum, and, and hope that I'm going to say and do the right things. Because you know, like you oh, said, it, 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 you didn't get a chance to look at my talk. You know, there's, there was no script here that you could go. No, no, we're gonna. You can't say that. So, 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 thank no. you for the opportunity to speak freely. I, I knew we were in safe hands with you. Thank you very much for your, for your time, David, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Absolutely, so, my friend. I, I look forward to shaking your hand. All righty. Take care now. We'll see you. Yeah, good night, you. everybody. Everyone right. have a great night. Have a good day for you too. Okay. We'll do. Cheers. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Cheers.